All right, why don't we get started? So, um, moving on to a new topic today, <clears throat> which is another form of cognitive memory, um, emotions. Um, and I want to start a little bit with the history of the study of emotions. And one of the first um, philosopher psychologist to address um, the question of emotion was Mil William James back in 1884. He wrote a paper called What is an Emotion? And he asked a simple question. That question was, do we run from a bear because we're afraid or are we afraid because we run? And this was really based on his idea that emotions are part of a reflex. So we talked about reflexes before, just the knee reflex that we talked about, the stretch reflex. And those are sensory inputs that come in through the spinal cord and then just go out automatically and um, automatically make some sort of movement. Um, his idea was, well, those seem to be very, very ingrained types of responses. Maybe it's just elaborated just a little bit more, even when we get up to the level of emotions. So his idea was a emotional stimulus, like a bear, okay, will call, uh, automatically cause you to start running and to start sweating and for your stomach to start hurting. And then your other sensory systems kick in later and say, hey, I'm running, I'm sweating, my stomach hurt, it's hurting. I must be afraid of something. And then you look around and you see this guy and say, okay, I'm afraid of a bear. So maybe not the most, maybe not how you might think about, uh, about it, but remember, this was very early days. And um, you could also get a different kind of emotion from uh, other pictures coming in, um, maybe a more relaxed uh, uh, feeling, happy feeling, and, um, uh, and the idea was you get this uh, picture coming in, it would relax you, you'd be happy, and then you'd notice that about yourself. you say, oh, I'm in a good mood. Okay, so here is the very simple brain circuit that William James proposed. And this is exactly what I just said. So emotional stimuli come in, and they're processed by sensory cortex. We know that. They knew that way back then. But it's immediately sent to motor cortex, either the running areas, if it's this kind of stimulus, or you know, just the happy relaxation areas, um, if it's this stimulus. Um, and the motor cortex then uh, um, allows us to do various bodily responses, running away or relaxing. Those bodily responses are then sensed by the sensory cortex, and then that is how the actual feeling comes about. That was the idea of Williams James. <clears throat> Another, um, um, really, uh, a neurophysiologist came along, um, Walter Cannon. This, again, was at the turn of the century, around 1900. Um, and Cannon disagreed with this um, circuit for a number of different reasons. First, he said that many emotional situations produce the same kind of bodily emotional responses. So you could be scared of a bear, or you could be nervous about a test. And you have the same kind of responses. You have sweaty palms. Um, you know, if you feel like running away, um, you have a stomach ache. And um, you really cannot differentiate from just the bodily output all the wide range of emotions that we really have. And I should say that uh, Walter Cannon's specialty was um, studying the body in crisis. And in particular, he was one of the first to identify what we talked about at the very beginning of the class, the autonomic nervous system. Remember the autonomic nervous system, this comes from the slide, the corrected slide, um, I think from our second lecture, um, uh, made up of autonomic nervous system, made up of the pa uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic um, subdivisions, where the sympathetic subdivision is that uh, fight or flight, that weekday system that will allow you to run away and, and protect yourself from things that are dangerous. And the parasympathetic system is doing kind of the opposite on the same kinds of organs instead of taking blood away from your stomach. So you're nervous uh, in this fight, flight or fight uh, situation. The parasympathetic gives um, uh, blood to the stomach so you can rest and digest, a relaxation kind of system. 
Walter Cannon was focused on the sympathetic nervous system and what happens to the body in crisis. And again, his observation was in crisis, you have the same exact types of bodily responses. So that this circuit here um, really would not be good at differentiating all the different feelings if, if all it was working on was uh, the output from the um, sympathetic nervous system, the output of the bodily responses. Okay, so that's the first reason he disagreed with James. Second, he said, wait a second, you need to think about it for a second. I don't have to start running to be fair, scared of that bear. I become scared of that bear as soon as I see it. Okay, so you, because you already feel the emotion, sometimes well before the stress and the bodily responses, before your stomach starts hurting, um, that also suggests that his, uh, that James's original circuit may not be right. And third, um, they already knew that emotion, in terms of rage. Um, does not depend on the cerebral cortex because you can elicit what's called sham rage. So sham rage um, was discovered when they did, um, uh, they, they damaged the cortex, they actually cut off the cortex to see what the animal could still do. And you know, with just slight stimulation, you could elicit a rage-like response as animals would hiss and, and start to attack anything. And they called this sham rage that you would see without the cortex. And this type of emotion, sham rage, is what Walter Cannon and his um, colleague Bard um, decided to look at. They wanted to understand the neural basis of this sham rage. Okay, um, and so here's what they did. Here is what type of cut is this in the brain? Sagittal, very good, okay. What is this structure right here? Say one more time. This structure, it's a white matter bundle. Corpus callosum, great. Here is the thalamus in the middle and here is the hypothalamus. So here's what they did. In experimental animals, they cut off all of this cortex and they observed in these animals, they, they, you know, they can still survive and they definitely exhibited sham rage, okay? So sham rage, again, just with a small provocation, you can get this very um, um, uh, um, emotional, uh, rage-like responses with hissing and spitting and fighting. But then they did another experiment, and they made this cut, second line. And they found animals could still walk around and, and um, do some sorts of functions, but no more sham rage. And what they concluded was that the key area to elicit these types of very emotional responses that needed to be intact was this area right here that is shaded in, the hypothalamus. So this was one of the first experiments to identify the hypothalamus as an area that is um, uh, involved in this kind of crisis, um, um, autonomic, sympathetic types of responses. Um, this was the area uh, uh, involved in all the hissing, all of the fighting, all of the um, uh, rage emotion that was seen in this abnormal situation, sham rage. But, but uh, still, very important uh, experiments in this evolution of our understanding of the brain area is important for emotion. Of course, focusing on rage as an emotion. So Cannon and Bard, um, focusing on the hypothalamus, proposed a slightly different circuit. Okay, And again, um, think about this in the same way as we thought about the, um, and we went over the evolution of how we thought declarative memory, memory for facts and events, might be um, processed. First, we thought it was all over the cortex. Um, uh, Lashley told us that it was um, the more the cortex was intact, the more memories that you had, and, and just the larger amount of cortex you damaged, um, uh, the larger the memory impairment. And then, of course, we had HM that really focused it in, and then we had the uh, animal studies that then focused it in even more onto those key structures, hippocampus, enterhinal, perirhinal. This is the same process we're going through now, just for the emotional system. So with the data from Cannon and Bard, they suggested that, again, emotional stimuli, bear or happy elephant coming in 
processed by the thalamus. They knew at this point that thalamus is processed, the major processing um, center for all sensory input, as we, as we learned in this class. Um, but uh, that it goes through two different routes. Um, um, the, the basic kind of sensory information goes through the cortex. And uh, the hypothalamus um, processes this, this information. And not only, um, they propose, gives output, the appropriate bodily output, the sympathetic nervous system crisis output, but it can also project back to the cortex to combine with this sensory information, and that creates the feeling. Okay? But they really highlighted the importance of the hypothalamus. Okay. I should say that at this time, again, in the early 1920s or 30s at the most, um, uh, these, some of these connections were um, known, uh, particularly these sensory inputs into the thalamus and thalamus to cortex, but a lot of these other ones were just being guessed at. So this was a hypothesis based on their experiments and just identification of this area that really seemed to be important. Okay. Oh, so sorry. And this shows um, this area, uh, this projection from thalamus to cortex is processing information about what the stimulus is. Ah, this is a bear. I recognize the bear. And this uh, um, pathway here was proposed to process the emotional significance of the stimulus. This is an angry bear. This is bad. This should be very, very scary. Okay. So that's the information coming through here. Now, um, the next stage along the line was a um, neuroanatomist named Papes. Has anybody heard of the Papes circuit in class? This is a very famous circuit. Um, and Papes was influenced very strongly by a neuroanatomist named Herrick. Okay? So Herrick was a comparative neuroanatomist and looked at the brain structure of lots of different species and said that, um, so again, we're looking on the medial surface of the brain, just like we were looking here, um, just like we were looking here. This is a larger human representation. And what Herrick um, argued is that this medial surface of the brain that includes the cingulate gyrus as part of the cortex. Here's the corpus callosum right here. He didn't talk about the corpus callosum, but he focused on the cingulate gyrus, the hippocampal gyrus, including the hippocampus, the mammillary bodies, and the hypothalamus. Um, all of these areas, he argued, were evolutionarily old. Because emotions, you have to have emotions. You have to be scared and, and run away from things to keep yourself safe and that these were the areas that uh, were evolutionarily spared because emotions are, are things that, that all organisms share, uh, basic emotions. And um, he also was influenced by a um, uh, um, neurologist, Paul Broca, that we'll talk about in the language section of the class, who um, named this part of the brain um, um, le grand lobe limbique. Limbique means rim. He thought it was the, is similar to, it looked like the similar, uh, it looked similar to a rim of a tennis racket, okay? So Papes um, um, kind of jumped on both the idea that these were evolutionarily old, might be important for basic kinds of functions like emotion, and that um, this was uh, called the, the limbic lobe by Broca. And he proposed what's called the Papes circuit, focusing on these areas. This was in 1937. So here now you can see uh, the same emotional stimulus is still coming into the thalamus, but now we've expanded out to not include just the hypothalamus, which Papes uh, appreciated from the work of Cannon and Bard, but the entire limbic lobe illustrated here. Um, did he know that all these things had direct connections? No, but they were all evolutionarily old and thought to be involved in the same types of processes, so he inferred that these areas probably were connected to each other. Okay? So here is, is the newest instantiation. Still you have the basics, thalamus going up to sensory cortex, but now all of the emotions are being processed by the cortical part of this Papes circuit, the limbic circuit, by the cingulate, lobe, uh, cingulate uh, cortex. Thalamus, um, um, the sensory information from the thalamus goes directly to the hypothalamus that gets processed here. Hypothalamus, as usual, goes out and gives us our bodily responses. And then this processing through here 
is uh, giving us uh, the, the feelings, the emotions that we feel through this evolutionarily old conserved part of um, the limbic lobe, again proposed by Papes. Okay. Now, 1937, Papes proposed this paper. It was, it was an okay uh, uh, paper. We're going to come back to who kind of resurrected this idea. But it was um, a, a uh, paper that was, uh, um, had some uh, influence at the time. 1937 was also a big year for the discovery of yet other um, aspects of emotion. And this was a syndrome called the Kluver-Busey syndrome. Two guys, Kluver and Busey, were very interested in psychoactive drugs. They were trying to figure out um, what parts of the brain were, were active when you were experiencing these psychoactive um, you know, uh, experiences. So LSD and all these different things. They say that they did a lot of self-experimentation in these drugs. But in the process, they looked at um, the effects of lesions on different parts of the brain. And what they identified was something quite striking. What they ended up doing was um, um, the entire temporal lobe would be removed in animals to see what would happen. And again, this is uh, 1937, um, same kind of experimental surgery that I talked about for William Scoville, not doing this in animals, but doing it in people to try and improve things like schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder, and epilepsy, as we talked about for HM. Kluver and Busey did the same things in animals, and they noticed something very, very striking when you removed both temporal lobes. Um, the animals started acting very, very odd. Um, they had hyperoral tendencies. What does that mean? They put everything in their mouth, okay? Everything, they explored everything in their world with their mouth. They became hypersexual, trying to copulate with anything, animate, inanimate, female, male, anything that would move, basically. Um, change in dietary habits, so um, monkeys, that are not carnivores would start eating raw meat. Just put it in their mouth, they just eat it. Just part of their hyperoral tendencies. Also, um, monkeys in particular that they were uh, looking at have, they're, they're wild, from, from the wild they have certain kinds of uh, responses, especially the male monkeys are quite aggressive. For anybody that comes into the room, they will, they will come up and if you approach their cage, they will take that as a threat and they will threaten you back. After this um, bilateral damage to the temporal lobe, the monkeys became completely just laid back. It's okay, come up to the cage, no problem at all. Now the other thing about animals, and, and monkeys in particular, is they have certain animals that they have innate fear to. Snakes, we have the same innate fear to snakes. So if you show them a real or a rubber snake, they will go crazy. Now, after this bilateral temporal lobe damage, you show them a rubber snake, they put it in their mouth, okay? So clearly something a little bit off here. Um, they called this syndrome psychic blindness. So they knew the animals could see just fine, but it was psychic blindness. They, did, they didn't seem to understand the meaning of these objects anymore. They had to put them in their mouths to kind of explore them in a more, uh, in a deeper way. And they ate indiscriminately. Um, again, food objects, non-food objects, they tried and mouthed and, and swallowed if they could. So clearly, um, and, and they, they took this as a, a completely a big change in the kind of emotional uh, life of these animals, particularly uh, the hypersexual uh, behavior and um, the, the lack of threatening anymore after this um, um, operation was done. So these studies uh, clearly identified the temporal lobe as an area, and that was included in the PAPE circuit. But they added, in particular, um, emphasis on the hippocampus and the amygdala as areas of emotional significance that they said, OK, I think the hippocampus and the amygdala are really important for emotional types of um, uh, uh, information, processing emotional. Remember, this is 1937. Again, Kluver and Busey, um, their, their first descriptions were also published in 1937. Now we move, yeah, oh, did you have a question? Yes. Oh, okay, so 
Yeah, they, she asked whether they gave the animals psychiatric drugs uh, after they removed their brains, uh, their temporal lobes, and the answer was no. Um, so those were kind of, I had the feeling from reading the papers that they did a lot of the uh, drug testing on themselves, and they did the you know, lesion studies on the animals. So, um, uh, so no, the, it wasn't done at the same time. Okay, but now we get up to 1949. 1949 was uh, um, remarkable because of the publication of a very, very influential paper by McLean, and he is now known as the great synthesizer. What he basically did is he took exactly Pape's circuit and added stronger evidence, really con convincing evidence at the time that really showed that, in fact, these areas did have a lot of evidence for being involved in emotional processing. What was that evidence? The evidence included um, um, information like um, uh, they knew that certain epileptic foci started around the hippocampus and that um, um, the aura that these people got right before their, um, their seizures was rage. They got very, very angry. And he said, aha, hippocampus, therefore, is part of the, this rage circuit because of this abnormal response. And we think that the, uh, uh, area, is, um, this, the, um, this area is involved. Um, there were also um, individual case study reports of tumors in the cingulate gyrus that would cause uh, um, uh, psychiatric problems in, in, in the patients. These were all single case studies. So this is, this is a difficulty. I, uh, I based my entire last two lectures basically on what we know from a single case study, patient HM. Of course, that finding was reproduced in animal studies, but for a long time it was the single case study. Nobody could do it again because it was so devastating. That turned out to be true, and we turned out to be able to learn many, many principles that have been now reproduced over and over and over. Here is a case where McLean also gave a, a number of uh, single case studies examples to support the idea that these areas were all um, synthesizing emotional information and that these areas were the emotional circuit. Turns out he was wrong. But you read the paper and it's very, very convincing. He was able to gather these individual case studies. And this is a good example of why case studies can be wrong, um, single case studies. And um, how do you know whether they're right or wrong? You don't. Single case studies are dangerous. There's only one of them. You really need to be careful and back them up with, um, uh, with either experimental evidence or more case studies that are also consistent with it. But McLean, uh, again, was very convincing and brought back the PAPE circuit from virtual obscurity to um, um, put it on the forefront as uh, identifying it as the um, circuit involved in processing emotional stimuli in the brain. So here is the circuit, PAPE circuit again, uh, modified by McLean. Um, same thing, he just added the amygdala in here, just shoved it in here. And, um, uh, and, but the same kind of circuit, this is the same diagram I showed for PAPES. Now the problem was, McLean got a little bit carried away. And not only did he include the amygdala in here because of the Kluver-Busey studies, but every case study that had some sort of emotional process, he started adding and adding structures to this list until the limbic lobe became the, the, the um, limbic circuit and the emotional circuit became so big it was unwieldy. unwieldy. McLean, the, again, this is 1949. What happened in 1957? Anybody remember? Big year? HM. HM happened in 1957 and that showed us um, in a very convincing way that bilateral damage um, to the hippocampus that they were emphasizing at that time um, did not produce overt emotional problems in HM, but obviously a profound memory deficit. And then this whole limbic circuit got, got kind of thrown, not thrown out the window, but, but um, um, questioned at a deep level. So we could ask ourselves at that time, 1957, so um, McLean was flying high in 1949, very influential paper. He seemed to have a lot of evidence, but we had this other case study that was, seemed to be very well um, um, controlled, very well described, still a st single case study, um, 
but um, actually I should mention, I didn't tell you this uh, at the first, uh, in the first couple of lectures, but one of the reasons why that paper in 1957 was so um, influential was that while they focused on patient HM, they actually described a total of 10 patients. Most of the other patients were neuropsychiatric patients where they had done either um, um, larger or smaller medial temporal lobe bilateral or unilateral resections. And um, so all of them showed that taken together, all 10 subjects showed that the larger the extent of the hippocampal damage, the more the higher impairment, the, the more severe impairment that you had. And of course, HM had, had the most medial temporal lobe and most hippocampus taken out bilaterally. So um, I don't mean to, I don't want to be uh, imprecise in calling that paper in 1957 a single case study because there were in fact were 10 subjects in that study. HM was the easiest to test because all the rest of them suffered from neuropsychiatric diseases, but they were all, most of them were tested on the cognitive and memory tasks uh, before and after their surgeries. And um, they all were consistent with this idea that the, the extent of hippocampal damage caused the extent of memory impairment. So uh, that does contrast with McLean's uh, evidence that all came from literally single case studies. Okay, so now we're in 1957 and we get asked what's wrong with the limbic system uh, theory proposed by this uh, kind of series of um, neuroanatomists and um, neuroscientists. Um, one was the limbic system had never been satisfactorily defined. People come around and they say, oh, I have this emotional finding here, I have this emotional finding here, so it just gets added to the list. That is not a reasoned uh, way or, or a, um, a strong rationale to add something to a brain system. Second, the system was proposed to be an emotional and not a cognitive system, but later research showed that a major limbic area, supposed to be limbic area, the hippocampus, is crucially involved in cognitive memory. So this was the problem of 1957 in HM and all of those studies. Three, most limbic areas have not been implicated in emotion. That is a biggie, okay? So as evidence, uh, uh, as, as time went by, you, you'd hope to gather evidence for a theory like this, that in fact, yes, there's lots of uh, um, emotional problems with damage here, damage here, and damage here, damage here. Um, clearly, everybody, uh, everybody agreed that this was a motor output to bodily responses, but that wasn't the argument. What is the area's kind of underlying actual feelings? And that was um, the uh, kind of uh, one of the crushing blows that most of these areas were not implicated in emotion as evidence accumulated. Um, and the fourth problem was that in attempting to explain all emotions at once, it explained no emotions very well. Okay, so so that was the uh, study of the emotional brain pre HM pre 1957. Now, what is the kind of modern study of emotion? And the modern study of emotion focuses on one structure. And it was, to their credit, they had identified it. Kluver and Busey, uh, it was one of the structures that they, were, uh, that they identified. And that is the amygdala. OK. And uh, we turn to 1957 and the study of HM as the kind of modern, the start of the modern study of our understanding of declarative memory. We turn to 1961 in a study done by Downer. This is all done in um, monkeys um, to first show and identify clearly for the first time that the amygdala is important for processing um, emotional stimuli. So what did they do? So what we're doing, what we're looking at here is a top-down view of the two halves of a monkey's hemisphere. Um, here's the corpus callosum going through here, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Here's the optic chiasm, and here's his two little eyes looking out this way, okay? And so what Downer did is he did a um, uh, splitting of the corpus callosum, and he also split the optic chiasm. Now, you should all understand what that means. That means that um, um, information, if you only give information to this eye, it's not crossing over, and only those uh, fibers that are going on the ipsilateral side are getting through. So this eye is only seeing, uh, sorry, uh, information from this eye is only processed 
on this side of the brain, and information from this eye is only processed on this side of the brain. So you can block this eye off, and you know that all visual information will only be processed on this side of the brain. Okay? Next, they made an amygdala lesion. It wasn't a selective one, it was just uh, damage to the anterior part of the temporal lobe. And what they ended up doing is um, um, showing animals stimuli to one eye or the other. Okay? So let's ask what happens. So also, we're going to block off so we can show uh, stimuli to only one eye or the other. So you tell me what happens. What does the animal do when he sees this? What? He gets scared. But where, what part of, the, what side of the brain is this image processed on? This side. There's no reaction. He tries to go and kiss the snake. Okay? Same animal. Let's show it this side. He freaks out. Okay? So, everybody get that? We can control what side of the brain is seeing these visual images. And this side of the brain has an amygdala lesion, and this side of the brain does not. And you can see that the, um, if you show an emotional stimulus to this side of the uh, visual field that goes to this side of the brain, the animal's like, yeah, big deal, snake biting somebody, I don't care. But the same exact stimulus shown to the same exact monkey in the other hemisphere where the amygdala is intact causes freak out. Major freak out, like you and I would be freaked out if we actually saw this picture in real life. Yes? Um, they did, uh, the main one they tested was fear, but they also tested it with um, kind of food stuff. So um, seeing uh, um, abnormal food on this side would um, cause them to mouth it or eat it inappropriately, and uh, they would have normal reactions um, seeing food on this side. But the main focus was on uh, responses to these clearly emotional stimuli where every single monkey in the colony will have a freak out if they see this. And then you show it to the side of the monkey's brain and he's, he's just fine, okay? So this was a reproduction of the kluver Busey syndrome in a much more, this is not just a whole temporal lobe resection. This is much more selective for the anterior temporal lobe focused on the amygdala, yes? Yes, um, they, uh, yeah, and I mean, it's, uh, it's simpler just to do this small little lesion. It was one of the possible substrates for, um, uh, for this emotional circuit. And so some, you know, at, uh, by chance, somebody will say, oh, let's just look at this one and see how, how good it is. And he got a very, very striking result. So yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, good, uh, that's a good question. We're going to talk about, if we get time, human studies where um, they have unilateral amygdala lesions and they still have impairment on fear types of, of tasks. So, um, but probably not nearly as severe as, as if you had bilateral uh, amygdala lesion. So this animal, if they didn't cut the corpus callosum and cut the optic chiasm um, or split the optic chiasm, would probably have partially impaired responses, but partially, you know, not nearly as bad as those Kluver Busey animals. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Okay. So now, finally, modern study of emotion, we are focused here on the amygdala. And here just, just reminds you that the purple amygdala right here sits right in front of the anterior part of the hippocampus in the front of the um, uh, anterior part of the temporal lobe. Here's the hippocampus, here's the tail, the fornix coming up around of the hippocampus. But again, we're focused on the amygdala. The amygdala means almond. Uh, the amygdala is an almond-shaped structure. You have two, one in the right hemisphere, temporal lobe, and one in the left um, temporal lobe. 
Okay, and here is another nice view uh, of the human uh, amygdala. If we take a, uh, here's an fMRI representation of the surface of the brain. We're taking a coronal section right here, and this is what the brain looks like. Here's the amygdala on this side and this side. Here is the caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus here. Here's the ventricles right here. This is the lateral sulcus, the sulcus right here. Um, so the amygdala uh, blown up is here, and you see different subdivisions. We're going to be talking about the different subdivisions of the amygdala later and what those uh, roles of those individual subdivisions are. And here is an MRI um, 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 representation of what you would see from an MRI of the amygdala, um, again, on both sides. And same location. This is the caudate up here. Here's the ventricles in black, and here's the putamen, globus pallidus right there. Okay, so a modern approach to emotional brain is one that we've taken to look at one specific emotion at a time. And the favorite emotion of emotional neuroscientists is fear. Why fear? Well, it's raw, it's primal, and it's evolutionarily conserved. So it's true what Herrick said, that there are certain parts of the brain that are conserved and, and all process this kind of raw fear response that's critical for your survival. Everybody from uh, everybody, every species from a newt to a human has these kinds of fear responses. Two, uh, it is, as I said, a universal survival mechanism. Not surprising that there are fear circuits in every species, including f flies, I should say. There's a nice slide coming up about all the different species in which fear has been studied. Three, um, fear is also very interesting because it is the root of many emotions and emotional disorders. Emotional disorders like phobias. Post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a huge issue right now with um, the war and um, uh, soldiers coming back from, from the war, most of them coming back have some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. How do we cure these people of this disorder? We'll talk about that a little bit. Panic disorders, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, paranoid states and emotional components of diseases all involved in this emotional fear system. So if we can understand the circuit, understand how it works, and the, um, uh, both the uh, brain areas involved, the circuits involved, the neurotransmitters involved, we might have a chance of actually going in and modifying that to actually cure these very widespread diseases. Okay, now how are you gonna study fear in the lab, in an animal? For that, we turn back to our old friend, Pavlov and his dog. We're, we talked about um, um, conditioning, the dog and the, and the um, bell and salivation conditioning that we said was dependent on the cerebellum. That is true. But once you add fear to this paradigm, you, um, you involve the amygdala. And it becomes a very precise way to look at um, um, fear learning in a wide range of animal systems. Okay, so here is how, oh, here is how we study fear in animals. And this same paradigm can be used for lots of different uh, species, including humans. Okay, so you have a rat in a box and you just play tone to him, not doing anything. He orients to the tone and you get the animal used to the tone. So, there's the sound. Not a very pretty sound. Okay, then what you do is you pair that sound. So you get the animal used to the sound, he's fine with the sound, big deal, he's just walking around, the sound doesn't bother him. But then you do a mean trick, you pair the sound with a foot, sh a foot shock, okay? So this floor has electrical current coming through it. And so uh, when the sound is played, you actually give him a foot shock and, and the sound and the foot shock are coming together. So what happens? 
he learns to fear the sound because the sound now predicts the foot shock. And so you can test this later. You don't give him the foot shock, but you only um, play him the sound again. And what he does to the sound is he shows fear. He freezes. So um, that deer in the headlights kind of look that, that humans give, rats give that too. That's called freezing. And you could measure freezing. You can measure blood pressure. Blood pressure goes up. Um, uh, you could measure stress hormones that will also go up. So you can show that before, there was no stress response to the sound. Sound was just fine. You got used to it. Sound was fine. But after this fear learning, this fear conditioning paradigm, you get a, um, a fear response to this sound. That is a, a, a very powerful paradigm of emotional learning. What's happening? What are the effects of a tone before and after fear conditioning? So as I said, before fear conditioning, tone has no effect, a physiological effect. Your sympathetic nervous system is not engaged at all. It's just a sensory stimulus comes in, big deal. But after fear conditioning, the tone becomes a fearful stimulus, and that tone alone can elicit what's called the conditioned fear response. So the tone will elicit freezing, mus muscle tension, increases in blood pressure, heart rate and respiration, and release of stress hormones, okay? All because of the specific pairing. Now, uh, I want to uh, make sure that you are familiar with these terms. You must learn these terms um, associated with fear conditioning. Um, the first is the unconditioned stimulus. The unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus that you don't have to um, teach the animal anything to have a typical kind of response. So the unconditioned stimulus here is the shock. So everybody will have a negative reaction to shocks. Nobody likes shocks. And the unconditioned response, the natural response to the shock is freezing. Okay? And the conditioned stimulus is the stimulus that is initially neutral but becomes imbued with fear. So the conditioned stimulus in this paradigm is the tone, okay? And um, uh, so again, uh, the uh, tone is played alone, no problems, and there's no um, um, very little freezing here. Uh, there's lots of freezing to the tone, of course, when he's getting the shock, and then there's equal amounts of freezing to the tone alone. Even when he's not getting the shock, um, um, after the uh, tone shock association has been learned. Yes? How many times does, does it take to elicit fear? That's a very good example. And the answer is it depends how hard you shock the animal. If you give them a really big shock only once, and it'll literally last the la rat's lifetime. If it's smaller, it'll take multiple repetitions. But generally, um, this fear system is a much faster learner than the declarative memory system, and it lasts a much longer time. So imagine, I mean, can anybody remember something that scared them and that still scares them today? That it's like hard to get rid of that scary, scary feeling. That is your amygdala system working. And the reason why it stays with you so long is because it's a different system from the hippocampal system. The hippocampal system, yeah, I could remember whatever last week's lecture, but um, I may not remember it as much as either a really, really emotionally bad event or a really, really emotionally good event. Uh, both those things are processed by the amygdala. What if you have retrograde amnesia? Retrograde amnesia, so, so that's a really good question. Does retrograde amnesia, that is um, um, memory impairment associated with a hippocampal uh, lesion, affect your fear system? And the answer is um, no. The hippocampus, the amygdala, um, uh, is uh, thought to be not only uh, the uh, um, important for encoding new fear memories, but uh, also the storage place of fear memories as well. So uh, they're separate systems, and we're going to talk about that in a second. OK, fear conditioning, you need to know US, UR, CS. And OK, so here are some species that exhibit fear conditioning. Look at all of these. Fruit flies, you can, fr you can, um, you can fear condition fruit flies with a smell shock association. 
and it's a really good smell. The flies usually like it, but you associate that smell with the shock, and those flies will fly away, okay? Cats, baboons, humans, dogs, macaques, rabbits, lizards, rats, even fish, even a slug will elicit, will, will exhibit fear conditioning. Okay, and this is great because we can do parallel studies in rats, we can do it in humans. And so now um, I just want to give you a quick demo of how we might do this in humans. Can I get a volunteer? A brave volunteer. I promise you will not get hurt. All right, come on up. Okay, if you can stand up here, right here. And if you can put your hand on the table, just like that. OK, this is my tool. <laughs> and this is the fear, OK? OK. So fear conditioning is associating a neutral stimulus. You have to keep your hand on the table. <laughs> associating a neutral stimulus with a fearful response, OK? So your neutral stimulus are colors, OK? So one of the colors that I'm going to say is going to be associated with a fearful stimulus. Okay, but I'm going to tell you what color it is. Okay? So, if you can close your eyes. I'm just going to start saying colors. Okay? Blue. Red. Green. <laughs> yellow. Purple. Chartreuse. Can't think of any more colors. Uh, lavender. Green. You're good. Yellow. Orange. Purple. Green. Okay. So, <laughs> what what was the association? I told you, I mean, this is a, this is a non-contact um, uh, non uh, experiment. So, um, but the funny thing is that there's this really big sweat mark where her hand was. <laughs> so even though she did not move, there was clearly, and that's exactly what we measure. We measure actually in humans a, um, a galvanic skin response. And that basically is, is the sweating. And so uh, before, if I, if I, you know, before I told you what the experiment is, and I measured your galvanic skin response to just colors, you would have no response. But by the end of that, um, that sweat was coming out in anticipation of my saying green. So thank you very much. OK, so that is how um, um, that <laughs> that's how um, you, could, you can test fear in humans. Now, here's a little test for you. Um, let's say, what is your name? Lauren. Lauren. Let's say Lauren has a hippocampal lesion, OK? And, um, but not an amygdala lesion. She has bilateral lesions to the hippocampus, perirunal, parahippocampal, enterorunal cortex, that whole area. But your, your amygdalas are fine, OK? So what would happen? She, she did this, she did this experiment, and um, what would her answer, what would your answer be to the question, um, what is the association that I taught you right now? You wouldn't know because you would have memory. Would you sweat? You would sweat because you had your amygdala, and your amygdala is connected up to the hypothalamus that has responses to your sweat glands. Um, let's say you had the opposite lesion. You had an amygdala lesion, but you had an intact hippocampus. Okay? What would you, um, would you sweat when I did this experiment with you? No, you wouldn't sweat, but would you, able, would be, would you be able to tell me what was happening during the experiment? Yeah. Yes, so, you, so if she had bilateral amygdala lesions, she would be able to say, oh, you hit the table with that hammer every time you said green. And then you'd say, were you scared? And they'd say, no. 
and you'd look at their skin response compared to normal, they would not have a skin response because the amygdala is the structure that has the key connection to those subcortical structures. Okay? Does everybody get that? There is a clear double dissociation between the types of memory and the types of learning that the hippocampus does and the amygdala does. You need to understand the difference between those two. Okay, any questions about that? What if you're a natural sweater? That's good. That, they're always sweaty, but you would be even more sweaty if you were up here. Okay, so, so that, that's taken care of. We have baseline sweat measurements, so you would be, yeah, you'd be fine. Okay, so here, uh, so now I want to uh, talk about uh, in more detail the um, flow of information um, from the emotional stimuli. We've been talking kind of vaguely about emotional stimuli coming into the brain. Um, and where exactly does it go and how exactly does it get processed by the amygdala? So here's something that happens. You're walking down the woods and you see something really scary, um, a snake. Uh, that visual information comes, comes through your visual cortex, the visual thalamus, and um, eventually gets to the level of the amygdala. And the amygdala um, produces, uh, helps produce the fear response that gets your muscles going and your heart rate up um, and, and uh, gives you that danger sign that gets you away from this potentially life-threatening situation. What are those pathways that are critical? Here is a very simplified version of how we know that that fearful information is getting to the amygdala, okay? So again, emotional stimulus, the bear, the snake, um, anything emotional still comes through the sensory thalamus. This could be either a um, visual emotional stimulus, like a picture of a bear, a picture of a snake, or a real life snake, or um, an auditory emotional stimulus, just that, that snake um, uh, could, could elicit fear. Um, so um, uh, either sensory or multiple sensory modalities have these kinds of pathways. So how does this information get to the amygdala? Um, Joe Ledoux, a very, very famous emotional uh, neuroscientist, um, not emotional neuroscientist, he's, he studies emotion, he's a neuroscientist that studies emotion, um, um, identified these two key pathways that emotional stimuli take to get the amygdala. He calls it the low road and the high road. What is the low road? The low road is the fast, dirty, quick way to get any kind of stimulus that could, could possibly be um, uh, dangerous to the amygdala. And that is a direct projection from the sensory thalamus directly to the amygdala. This is quick, it's fast in terms of low numbers of synapses and low response times to get to the amygdala, but it's dirty because you don't have all of the elaborate processing of visual or auditory information that you might get. It's just at the level of the thalamus. So you, you learned a kind of low level vision that the LGN and um, also the auditory thalamus do, that kind of information uh, still can be recognized as dangerous versus non-dangerous, emotional versus non-emotional, and that can be projected to the amygdala where um, you get the motor output, the fleeing response. The amygdala is the structure that is activating the, um, the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. Now, the second pathway, here's the quick and dirty pathway, the second pathway is the um, 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 slow but accurate pathway. And that pathway goes through primary sensory cortex, primary auditory cortex, primary visual cortex. There are multiple uh, synapses before that information can get to the amygdala. It still gets there, but it's much slower, but it gives you um, more information. So you might see, you might think, uh, first, there, uh, uh, um, a stimulus here is a snake, you might start running, but then you look a little bit closer or just a few uh, uh, hundreds of milliseconds later, you realize actually it's not a stick, it's not a snake, it's a stick, okay? But you want to have that possibility of recognizing a potentially dangerous um, visual or auditory stimulus quick, and that's why um, uh, you have, uh, that's, that's how this quick and dirty pathway works. Um, but this provides uh, more detailed information that, so you can get the fuller picture from a sensory point of view, okay? So that's how general emotional information, sensory emotional stimuli get to the amygdala. But what I want to um, 
focus on next is um, this actual pathway. So we not only know how emotional stimuli get in, but we've worked out the precise pathway that um, is involved in fear conditioning in this kind of tone shock fear conditioning that is so widely studied in um, the rodent. And so let's look at that. Um, before I do that, let me just give you an overview of these um, brain areas within the amygdala. So the amygdala is one almond-shaped structure, but like many of the structures, the hippocampus has multiple subdivisions. We really didn't go over it, but it does. I just wanted to show you the, uh, the complexity of the amygdala. Here, I'm outlining here the amygdala and some of the key nuclei. The lateral nucleus is here, the basal nucleus, the accessory basal nucleus, and the central nucleus. The two nuclei that I want you to learn and I want to focus on are one, the lateral nucleus, and two, the central nucleus. Here, oops, oh, it's not working. Okay, here's the lateral nucleus. You can see a lit up for a second. Lateral nucleus is the major input receiving structure of the amygdala. That is where sensory information is coming in to the amygdala. Lateral nucleus projects to the central nucleus. Central nucleus is not the input structure, it is the output structure. This is the nucleus. These neurons here have direct projections to the hypothalamus that activate freezing, changes in blood pressure, changes in heart rate, and changes in stress hormones, also controlled by the hypothalamus. Remember that chapter we, we talked about all of those intricate feedback mechanisms from the hypothalamus to the um, 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 pituitary gland and then out through the rest of the body. That, uh, here's one nucleus in the brain, the central nucleus of the amygdala that is helping to control those, um, those uh, um, hypothalamic structures. Okay, and so now after introducing that so you can actually have a, a view of this, uh, let me just say one more word. This is a coronal section through a rat brain and all of these cells are, um, you, the little dots are cell bodies stained by nissel stain. We looked at a nissel stain before and so that's what you're looking at. You're a big blow up view, humongous view of the rat amygdala. And there's lots of similarities, um, oops. Okay, it doesn't let me go. Um, to the human amygdala, the same subdivisions are in the human amygdala as in the rat amygdala. Okay, so here is a slide that I want you to know. Um, we are looking at uh, the same kind of pathways, um, the high road and the low road, um, um, but expanded out. And we're going to look through the CS pathway, the conditioned stimulus pathway. What was the conditioned stimulus again? The tone, thank you very much, excellent. Um, the unconditioned stimulus pathway, what was the unconditioned stimulus? That stimulus that gives a natural response? The shock. And then the conditioned response pathway is um, it's the response pathway that is activated from the conditioned stimulus. So once the conditioned stimulus gets associated with that pathway, the response is now called the conditioned response. Okay, so CS, conditioned uh, stimulus. This is the tone. The tone is coming through the auditory thalamus. Now you're going to fill in all the details you know about the auditory system before we get to the auditory thalamus. So, so you know this from our auditory system. But um, what we're focused on here is the auditory thalamus, as you know, projects to primary auditory cortex. Here is the fast, the quick and dirty pathway auditory thalamus directly to the amygdala, not just to any part of the amygdala, but to the lateral nucleus, the input structure. Um, it, lateral nucleus also gets the more highly processed information from auditory cortex to other processing areas that this is just represents the uh, more uh, detailed processed auditory information. LA is a critical point in the amygdala because it is receiving convergent input both from the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. The unconditioned stimulus was our shock or is our shock. 
shock is going through the somatosensory thalamus and it also has two pathways, a quick and dirty, hey, this is bad, this is a shock. We're also going to the lateral nucleus and it has a more refined pathway through a primary somatosensory cortex that also goes to the lateral nucleus. But individual neurons within the lateral nucleus are uh, receiving uh, convergent input from the tone and the shock. This is where the dissociation between the tone and the shock is taking place on individual neurons in the lateral nucleus, okay? Now, the lateral nucleus, as I said, projects to that other little nucleus right next door, the central nucleus. It's a very small nucleus within the amygdala. It's the central nucleus that then projects out, neurons here project out to um, uh, different uh, um, hypothalamic areas involved in freezing, blood pressure, hormones. You don't need to know these areas. Just know that the central nucleus projects to the hypothalamus and elicits all of these bodily responses associated with that fear response, freezing, uh, increased heart rate, and increased, um, increased um, uh, um, uh, stress hormones. Um, these are just a few of the names of the neuroscientists that help work out this circuit. Very, very exciting work. We don't have time to go over all of the kind of sequence of elegant experiments that were done to work this circuit out, but uh, you should certainly know uh, Joe Ledoux, a very famous researcher right here in the Center for Neural Science that was one of the, um, uh, one of the um, founders of this area, um, uh, a huge researcher in this area, Mike Davis, Bruce Kapp, and Mike Fanslow are also um, uh, important contributors. But these are the pathways, and it was critical um, to know, um, and, and I just want you to appreciate that we went from um, William James trying to figure out whether we run from a bear because we're scared or because we're scared because we run from a bear to understanding the exact sensory circuits involved in a specific form of fear memory and fear elicitation, which is um, fear conditioning circuit. So we've really come a long way in our understanding of fear. And a lot of this, again, was because we focused not on all kinds of emotions, happy, sad, you know, uh, disappointed, but one circuit uh, and one emotion that could be worked out specifically. OK, so in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about a couple of um, um, uh, findings in humans. So it's great to work out uh, these circuits in animals. We also want to ensure that um, these uh, circuits are working the same way in humans and that the um, details that we understand from the rodent uh, brain are, are applicable to humans. So here are a couple of uh, very uh, um, um, important studies. Um, one in which uh, people are studying um, uh, again, Ledoux and uh, Liz Phelps, also here at the Center for Neuroscience. Kevin LaBar was a graduate student in the Center for Neuroscience, is now at Duke, studying patients with unilateral amygdala lesions and showing that even a unilateral amygdala lesion in a human will cause um, impairment in, um, in um, fear conditioning. This was uh, very similar to our example right here. They show colors on a computer screen and they actually got hooked up to a shock machine. The shock machine was, it wasn't severe pain, but it was annoying pain. And um, so uh, uh, epileptic patients and control subjects, so this was an epileptic patient with removal, these were epileptic controls, um, could condition to the, um, uh, to the uh, color shock association, but the temporal lobectomy uh, patient uh, did not do that um, significantly, and uh, they also um, uh, extinguished um, their, their responses down here. But here is the key finding that humans with uh, temporal lobe damage involving the amygdala have impairment at this kind of fear conditioning. Damasio and his colleagues studied um, a syndrome in which you get selective bilateral calcification of the amygdala. It's a very, very rare syndrome. And um, you, uh, um, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, but it's quite selective to the amygdala. You can see right here the holes in the amygdala, but this patient has completely intact hippocampi right here. So this, uh, they did an experiment that was published in Science, a very, uh, um, uh, a very influential study, where they basically studied 
three different patients, and you are able, I'm sure, uh, to give me the answers to these questions. So they had one patient with bilateral amygdala damage, one patient with bilateral hippocampal damage, and one patient with bilateral hippocampus plus amygdala damage. And they tested them on one, fear conditioning, two, episodic memory, um, and uh, looked at the difference between the two. And um, just as you, as you would predict, the patient with amygdala damage, could they fear condition? No, they would, they would not learn the association, they would not have the fear response, but they can tell you all about what was happening. They would be able to say, yeah, you know, that, that is, um, you're gonna shock me now, you know, when that color comes up, but, but there's no, uh, um, no response. Um, the uh, hippocampal patient, um, in addition to, um, so they did another test, on this hippocampal patient. Again, bilateral hippocampal damage, but no, um, uh, no amygdala damage. And um, this patient came in to uh, uh, come into the test one day, and um, a researcher not known to this patient, the patient doesn't really recognize new people anyway, goes and shakes his hand, but he has one of those buzzers in his hand, you know? And the patient gets really scared, he doesn't like it. It's, oh, you know, it's a joke, no problem. And so, um, the next week, the patient comes back. The same doctor is there. And um, the doctor says, do you remember me? He says, no, I don't think we've met before. He says, are you sure? And uh, the patient says, no. And the doctor says, nice to meet you. And the patient says, no, don't want to shake your hand. And, and you say, why? Why don't you want to shake my hand? He says, don't know. Don't feel like shaking your hand. So that is the amygdala working. There's no conscious recollection, but there is a fear there of the memory for that buzzer. That was an unpleasant event. So no memory of the person, no memory of the event, but there, there is a memory in that hippocampal patient of that lasting negative thing. I would have done that to you, but I couldn't get to the store to find a buzzer, so I did the <laughs> hammer instead. Okay, so Damasio did in a science paper that double dissociation. Um, of, of um, uh, both anecdotally with the handshake of the patient, but also with a, a classic fear conditioning paradigm that's exactly like what we do in rodents and showed that in fact it works in exactly the way that we would think. And finally, the last thing that I'll go over is um, uh, the question of what, what else is impaired in these patients with amygdala damage because um, uh, this is expanding out a little bit more beyond fear. And one of the really important discoveries in uh, these rare patients with bilateral, look, look at this. See those little black holes right there? That is a selective bilateral lesion of the amygdala. That is what this disease, this calcification of the amygdala does. It's like a surgical lesion um, here. And what they showed is these patients, clearly they can't condition to fear conditioning, but what they have is um, abnormal, um, um, uh, use of eye movements, abnormal eye movements. So controls, when looking at a stimulus like this, this is a face that's kind of scary, um, what you see here are the um, eye movements of the patient, of a normal patient on this face. You scan the eyes, you look at the mouth, you know, the lip curl back. Same here, this guy is scared, and the normal uh, uh, subject is looking at the eyes and the mouth. A patient with bilateral amygdala lesions does not do that. They look at the nose. They look at various other parts of the face. They're not focused in on those areas that are giving you information about uh, the emotional content of the face. So something, there's something kind of deeper about uh, that the amygdala is doing that helps normal people focus in on what we know are the key emotional aspects. What are the eyes looking at? Are they smiling eyes? Are they scared eyes? Are they surprised eyes? That's what we all focus on. You and I would all focus on normally the eyes. When you have amygdala damage, this is one of the things that, that is abnormal. So that kind of gives a depth to what the amygdala is doing. It's not, I don't want you to go away with, oh, it's just simple, just uh, associates tones and shocks. It's also helping us process information in a species-specific way, in a very important way for social interaction, because this kind of information that you're getting from the eyes and the mouth are critical for normal social interaction. And in fact, patients with amygdala lesions do have abnormal social interactions. Okay, happy Thanksgiving, have a great holiday, and see you on Monday.